I see something extraordinary on the horizon. And as I have said, women and especially mothers play a key role. Now that you're understanding the difference between mind and heart, let me begin to unfold what I see by opening with an impression of contrast. I was flying home from speaking at a conference, and as I was looking down at the cities below, I was thinking how tiny they looked from where I was. And for whatever reason, I tried to picture the Tower of Babel down there, maybe because I was trying to imagine a really big building. I pictured how massive the tower looked to the ones who were building it. I could imagine them standing at the base of it, looking up and going, Wow, look what we have built by the workmanship of our own hands. This is magnificent. We can see it must surely reach right up to heaven. We can just climb up there ourselves and bring on the floodwaters again. We've got it covered this time. We'll just climb our ways to safety. Then I tried to imagine it from God's perspective. I was just a couple of miles up, but even from my vantage point, it was small and insignificant. Then the tower switched to another tower in my mind's eye. Some of the tallest towers in the world are bank towers, and I pictured all the money in all the banks piled up in gold bricks all around the tower. From my point of view, it was just a little speck down there. Then I tried to imagine how big the country was. I was maybe taking in 50 or 100 square miles. How far did the country go? For that matter, how big was 25,000 miles around the world? It was huge. And that little bank tower and all its gold bricks became even more of a speck. Then I thought of the earth, which seemed so huge, and imagined it next to the sun, and the earth became a dot. Then the whole solar system was put against the Milky Way, and our solar system became a dot. Then the Milky Way was put against the universe, and the Milky Way became a dot. And that bank tower and the Tower of Babel became a tiny particle of nothing. Then came the impression of the contrast. As I looked around, I saw light as far as the eye could see, and I thought of how we're taught the light of God fills the immensity of space. Think of the comparison between the little tower of gold and this light. We use different words for this light. Spirit of the Lord, truth, inspiration, living waters, that when we drink this water we never thirst again. The effect of this light upon us, the fruits of this Spirit, are peace, love, joy, and understanding. These are its gifts. The light is a pearl of great price that the merchant would sell all he had to possess it. In earth's economy, the richest person is the one with the most money. In heaven's economy, the richest person is the one with the greatest capacity for this endless light and thereby the greatest capacity for peace, love, and especially joy. So the question at hand is, how do we increase our capacity for light so that more of it can be released in the world? We see forces combining together to do works of darkness and destruction. What are the forces that combine together to release light? Helping our children to live lives of maximum joy is the purpose of this heart-based method of learning, so understanding the answer to this question is critical. I believe these two forces are heart and mind, working in combination. Or, in other words, the more the heart desires that which is good and beautiful and true, and the more the mind is willing to comply with two principles and laws, the greater the release of light in our lives. Take away either half of the combination and the light is blocked. Let me try and build my case. As I've stated before, we're a very mind-focused, academic-based culture. We lean heavily towards the mind side of the combination. Let's do a quick review. It will take us seven times, right? Remember, how can you tell if you are in the realm of the mind? You can test and measure it. How far away is the sun? What is the population of New York? The mind feeds on facts and information. 
we associate reason and science with the mind which is concerned with discovering the laws, principles, and rules by which the universe operates. The mind demands proof and hard evidence. Science and mind are good. The heart, on the other hand, is immeasurable. How wide is joy? How deep is love? The heart is the place of desires, dreams, and visions. The arts, imagery, music, poetry, and story, warm and open hearts and travel to a place deep within us that words alone cannot reach. Hard-heartedness blocks light. There is an order to this combination. Notice the heart develops before the brain within the womb, and the emotions develop before the intellect outside the womb. It appears nature has reserved childhood for making impressions on the heart while it is open and uncluttered, and mothers are divinely gifted for this heart work. As simple as the combination of heart and mind appears, the world has had a really hard time holding on to the balance. We lean toward one side or the other. Yet history shows us that when heart and mind, faith and reason, art and science combine together in balance, there is a burst of light in the world. We call these golden ages. Let me show you what I mean as I take you on a brief tour through history. Let's first go back to the 5th century ancient Greeks, which is known as the Golden Age of Greece. Here you find Socrates going around teaching people to think and question functions of the mind. We see great dramatists such as Sophocles, Euripides, Aristophanes keeping the hearts of the people warm. Pericles is a wise ruler who has given the people wise rules to follow. But he is also a lover of the arts, and he commissions buildings such as the Parthenon and the Acropolis that are built to the highest standards of math and engineering, but also crafted by artisans who love beauty, heart, and mind. Even their ruins inspire us. The ancient Greeks are known for their love of beauty and truth, and they continue to influence the world 2,500 years later. Following a series of wars, the Greeks could sense their golden age was slipping, and they started leaning toward the mind to solve their problems. They reasoned that what they needed to do was build large academies and teach the young men how to think and reason and persuade others. They hoped the academies would produce great leaders to lead them back to their golden age. But in the process, the heart was left behind. Not only did these academies fail to produce a single leader of note, the Greeks slipped into slavery, never to rise again. Fast forward several hundred years. Now things have swung the other way and you find a people who were ruled by their hearts. The power players of the time are the storytellers and bards who know they can sway the people any way they want with their stories and songs. The people are driven by their fears, based in superstition and false traditions. We call it the Dark Ages. Only half the combination, so the light is blocked. Now go forward a few more hundred years to the 14th century, when the intellectual writings of the Greeks made their way to Europe by way of Italy, and there is this wonderful rebirth, which is what Renaissance means, and another golden age where, for a time, mind and heart, faith and reason, art and science combine together. Look at the shining stars of the 1400s and 1500s. Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Shakespeare, Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler, Martin Luther. We see Columbus and all the explorers out looking for new worlds and possibilities. Light began to burst upon the earth. And then man looks around and says, Man is magnificent. Look what we have accomplished by the workmanship of our own hands. And they leave God and the heart behind and enter a new age of reason. It was in this age of reason of the 18th century that a tender-hearted, kind man arrives on the scene named Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi. He looks around and notices that for all the learning going on, it's not making anyone's lives any better. The people are miserable, especially the children. 
The adults are so anxious for them to get into the Greek writings that they start hammering Greek into them almost as soon as they can talk. And so a great desire grew in his heart. He wrote, I wish to wrest education from cheap, artificial teaching tricks and entrust it to the eternal process of nature herself, to the light which God has kindled and kept alive in the hearts of fathers and mothers. Love is the sole and everlasting foundation in which to work. He continued, The primary law is this. The first instruction of the child should never be the business of the head or of the reason. It should always be the business of the heart. It is for a long time the business of the heart before it is the business of reason. He was given a charge over a classroom of orphans and started incorporating the tools of the heart, stories, songs, pictures, and rhymes, even though he didn't have much to work with. Even then, there were school administrators who stopped by. Ahem, Mr. Pestalozzi, where are your test scores? And Pestalozzi would say, Look around. The children are happy. They're engaged in learning. They're teaching each other. Yet he would be given that stern look of disapproval. Through his work, Pestalozzi came to realize that the mother is the most effective educator of the heart. He wrote, The eternal laws of nature lead me back to your hand, mother. He faced bitter opposition to the idea his whole life. One of his followers was a man named Friedrich Froebel, who also understood it was the mothers who were the most important teachers of the heart. The problem was the mothers were overworked and exhausted just trying to keep their families alive. He knew they weren't likely to add one more thing to their lives. But he noticed it was usually the oldest daughter in the family who had charge of the younger ones. So he thought, what if we open a school and invite these older girls to bring their younger siblings and teach them together so that when they become mothers, they'll be prepared? He felt it may take three generations to implement the idea. So he created the kindergarten or child garden, a place to grow children, and the first classes were formed to train future mothers. Love was to be the keystone. Froebel described the activities of this kindergarten. Free play, several sorts of handiwork suited to little children, going for walks, learning music, both instrumental and vocal, learning the repetition of poetry, storytelling, looking at really good pictures, aiding in domestic occupations, gardening. The years went by and the little mothers had children of their own, and these children were the ones that formed the first actual kindergarten. Also, these were the mothers who formed the first mothers' clubs, and it was the success of these clubs that attracted the attention of the authorities, who could not imagine any other purpose for a club than to hatch a plot against the government. Officials thought, here comes a man who thinks he knows more than all the priests and scholars who ever lived and fills the heads of full women with the idea that they are born to teach instead of to work in the fields and keep house and wait on men. If this thing keeps on, men will have to get off the earth and women and children will run the world and do it by means of play. This thing has got to stop before Germany becomes the joke of mankind. And so, in 1850, an interdict was placed on Friedrich Froebel, making kindergarten a crime. His ideas were spreading. Success at last was at the door. He had interested the women and proved the fitness of women to teach. His mother's clubs were numerous. Love was the watchword. And in the midst of this flowering time, the official order came, without warning, apology, or explanation, and from which there was no appeal. It crushed the life and broke the heart of Friedrich Froebel. The chapter I gleaned this from closed with these words. Men who govern should be those with a reasonable doubt concerning their own infallibility and an earnest faith in men, women, and children. To teach is better than to rule. We are all children in the kindergarten of God. I like that. So here we are again, trying to convince mothers that they possess God-given gifts to do what no one else can do better. 
and the learning is best begun in play, in poetry, in story, picture, singing, and music, and spending time in nature. And it may yet take three more generations to get the idea firmly planted, because it seems we have to keep starting over. Pestalozzi said it may take 300 years to get his idea to take hold. Can we be the generation that finally gets it right? Although Pestalozzi and Froebel felt like failures in their lifetimes, their writings continued to influence other educators into the 19th century, like Charlotte Mason who wrote, We allow no separation to grow up between the intellectual and spiritual life of children, but teach them that the divine spirit has constant access to their spirits and is their continual helper in all the interests, duties, and joys of life. She taught that true education is between a child's soul and God. Maria Montessori was also influenced by Pestalozzi. On the opening day of her school in one of the poorest sections of Rome, she read from Isaiah, Arise, shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. At the conclusion of her speech, she added, Perhaps it may be that this children's home may become a new Jerusalem, which, as it is multiplied, will bring light into education. She was criticized and asked what she meant, and she replied that she scarcely knew. Pestalozzi also influenced Rudolf Steiner, who created the Waldorf methodology in schools, still popular today. And then something wonderful happened. There was a group of intellectual giants, men and women who were scholars in history, literature, nature, art, and music. These are the great souls who have been my mentors. As they came to understand the importance of stories to warm and open children's hearts, they wrapped their great knowledge into stories for young people and loaded them with principles for happy living and fed children's hearts with desires for the love of the good and the beautiful and a faith in God. It's not uncommon to read in their prefaces things like, Dear boys and girls, I love you. I want you to be happy. The years from 1880 to 1920 are known as the golden age of children's literature that you've heard me talk about, the balance of heart and mind, faith and reason, art and science. Then something else wonderful started to happen. The mothers started doing what mothers do. They started gathering and organizing and forming study groups to relearn the lost arts of storytelling in their homes. And there was a great storytelling revival in the early 1900s. Then, realizing the importance of educating a woman's heart for her important role as heart educator and the difficulty for her to go away to college, the Delphian Society was formed in 1910 with the intent to bring college home to busy mothers who could only study a few minutes a day. The Delphian reading course was the equivalent to a bachelor's degree in classic studies and included a study of history, literature, philosophy, poetry, fiction, drama, art, ethics, music, nature study, and more. As women studied the great civilizations of the world, it included a look at home life and education. The focus was on culture, to know the best that has been thought and said in the world with the aim of personal improvement of each member, who in turn would lift all of society. It was about making of the mind a mansion of all lovely thoughts. Women formed study groups and met once a month to have conversations about what they were learning, and they became a cultural uplift to their communities. Within a few years, Over 2,000 groups dotted the nation and were found in every major city. Is it a coincidence that the generation that followed is known as the greatest generation? By the way, the Delphian Society was part of the inspiration behind the Organization of Mothers of Influence, which you'll learn more about in Section 6, and the Delphian Reading Course has been incorporated in the studies in Libraries of Hope. You'll learn more about that in Section 5. Continuing with the tour of history, then came the 1920s and 30s, and once again man said, Isn't man magnificent? 
and an educator named John Dewey changed the course of education for decades to come. His intentions were revealed in a document to which he affixed his name in 1933, the Humanist Manifesto, which declares, Reason and intelligence are the most effective instruments that humankind possesses. There is no substitute. And, by the way, there is no God. We've entered another age of reason, of facts and information, scientific proof and evidence, test and measure, and something has happened that Hans Christian Andersen warned would happen if the mind ruled. If the mind ruled. Remember the story of the Snow Queen I shared earlier? Our world has turned upside down. That which was bad is now seen as good, and that which was good is now seen as bad. Every fault is magnified, and every good is mocked. I hope you can begin to see why the call for more math and science, more rigorous academics, more focus on STEM subjects, the introduction of academics at earlier and earlier ages, and our obsession with test scores is actually fueling our problems. We are trying the failed solution of the Greeks. But here's what I can't stop thinking about. This is the extraordinary event I can see just over the horizon. What if we can hold on to this height of intellect? They tell us knowledge is doubling every 72 hours. What if we can combine this height of mind with a proportionate depth of heart. Would we not expect to see a new burst of light upon the world and the entrance into a golden age unlike the world has ever seen? Look at what technology has gifted us in just the last 15 years to make this combination of heart and mind possible. We have been gifted the finest literature that has ever been written, written by the greatest souls who have ever lived. In the 10th century, a princess gave 200 sheep, a load of wheat, a load of rye, a load of millet, and several costly furs for one copy of a German monk's writing. In 1999, Internet Archive was formed for the purpose of digitizing every book that has ever been written and posting it online for anyone to read for free. There are now over 17 million books available in the online library, and they are adding a thousand books a day, which gives us instant access to the thoughts and ideas of the greatest men and women who have ever lived. Part of that great harvest of books include the children and young adult books included in Libraries of Hope and the writings of the heart educators I share in the Mother's University. The recent availability of their writings is enabling us to relearn the lost arts of educating hearts, which has disappeared in our obsession with the mind. Along the way, technology gifted us with a tablet to make the reading of these treasures convenient and portable. We have been gifted with access to fine art. In the 15th century, when the great Florentine artist Cimabue completed his Madonna, the shops were closed, workmen dropped their tools, farmers left their tasks, the soldiers were released from the camp, all the people assembled in the streets. The artist was borne on the shoulders of the multitude. The picture was lifted up and carried at the head of a procession that marched with music and banners and tumultuous shouts and tumultuous shouts toward the church, where the canvas was hung that all might feast of their eyes upon its loveliness. All that for one painting. Today I can do a Google search and pull up hundreds of thousands of masterpieces of art that have been hidden away in private estates, museums, and palaces around the world. We have been gifted with masterpieces of music. YouTube has only been around since 2005, but now I can pull up just about any great masterpiece of music and watch it performed by the finest musicians in the world. I get front row seats to the Bolshoi Ballet and the Metropolitan Opera. When I get ready to do my dishes, I can invite Leonard Bernstein into my kitchen, along with his entire symphony orchestra, and give him a playlist to play for me, in surround sound, without charge. And if he plays something I really love, 
I just ask him to play it again. The kings and queens of yesterday, with all their wealth and power, could not have had the kind of heart education now delivered to the humblest home for free. This is an education fit for a royal generation of a golden age. I see just one missing piece for this combination of heart and mind to happen, and for that missing piece I need to go back to the golden age of ancient Greece. Scholars attribute the opening of this age to a poet named Pindar, who awakened a desire for beauty in the hearts of the Greeks through his poetry. But who awakened that desire in Pindar? I found the answer in an old children's book. Pindar's teachers, as a youth, were two women, Clertus and Myrna, two renowned singers who sang songs into his heart. What we need now is a generation of mothers who can sing songs into the hearts of their children and awaken their desire to feast on this great harvest of the ages that has just been delivered to their homes, free for their use. But who will t sing the songs into the mother's hearts? For it will be out of the abundance and treasures of their hearts that the children will be fed. Tending to mother's hearts is what is behind the mother's university at the well-educated heart and through mothers of influence. We have everything we need to cultivate our hearts and the hearts of our children. I'll talk more about the how coming up. I see mothers picking up the work where it was left off a hundred years ago while we took a detour, but we needed this little detour. We needed this reign of the mind for technology to thrive and make it possible for the work to continue. Look at the labor-saving devices given you to free up your time for this work of cultivating hearts. You can put your dirty clothes in a washing machine, push a button, and walk away. You can put your dirty dishes in a dishwasher, push a button, and walk away. You can put dinner in the microwave, and five minutes later, you're ready to eat. Turn on a faucet, and hot water comes out. The mothers of our 6,000-year written history must look upon our generation with envy. But where much is given, much is expected. I just want to close this little talk with a sampling of what a little light can do. A daring experiment ran, run in 1982 during the war between Lebanon and Israel was referenced by Greg Braden in a book called The Spontaneous Healing of Belief. Researchers trained a group of people to feel peace within. At appointed times on specific days of the month, these people were positioned throughout the war-torn areas of the Middle East. During the window of time when they were feeling peace, terrorist activities ceased. The rate of crimes against people went down. The number of emergency room visits declined, and the incidence of traffic declined. When the participants' feelings changed, the statistics were reversed. This study confirmed the earlier findings. When a small percentage of the population achieved peace within themselves, it was reflected in the world around them. The study became known as the International Peace Project in the Middle East, and the results were eventually published in the Journal of Conflict Resolution in 1988. You are the first generation of mothers to arrive on the scene when all things have been prepared to usher in the next stage. In this section, you will learn more about the tools you have to work with. Mothers are doing what they've always done. They're beginning to gather and organize. And I invite you again to become a mother of influence, which you will learn more about in section six. I believe angels are standing by ready to assist you in this important work. A little leaven, a little salt, even a single candle in a dark room can make a difference. By small and simple means, great things will come to pass.